Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and I'm joined by my brother, the Gritty Broman. How are you, Brent? I'm well. Thank you. Right on. Today's podcast, we're going to talk a little bit about skulls and cleaning skulls. Just a short little episode. Uh, some of you have been asking about, you know, bleaching skulls or kind of that DIY taxidermy. It's really pretty simple, and we get into it today. I have a process that I follow. It's basic. It's not that hard kind of walk you through a little bit. But um, if you're listening to the podcast, you might want to watch it because there's some cool critters here. We got this uh, Arizona skull here that I kind of, you might want to take a look at of this, this buck, archery buck I just took. And this is that warrior bear skull. And uh, I love this thing. This is a gnarly bear, probably the oldest bear I've ever taken. Just a giant, uh, especially for a mountain you know, an inland mountain bear, black bear in the lower 48, you know, I've shot some bigger schooled bears with some gnarly, you know, some gnarly age on them in Prince on Prince of Wales Island, but that's kind of to be expected. You know, you can go there and find that kind of thing, but out here, I have no idea how old this bear is, but we get into a little bit. He's missing half the teeth. They're broken off, but it's a, it's a good visual. Let's check it out. Uh, before we jump into the podcast, I want to mention a couple of items that are new with Gritty. We've got uh, some films that are going to drop here real soon. Both of this, uh, we got this mule deer hunt and javelina hunt in Arizona. We take you on a little uh, little hunt there, a couple of episodes. And then we've got uh, like five episodes of Kodiak Island Sitka blacktail deer that are really cool that we're going to bring as well. So I think we're going to keep you busy for like seven Sundays in a row. So maybe eight, if we can, if we, if we can get another show worth putting together, keep you busy for two months, keep your Sundays occupied for two months. And then, uh, Lampers and I have some hunts on the books. We're going to try to capture some more footage here soon and get that out to you as well. Um, so be looking for that. And also we are doing some discount codes with canvas cutter. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that don't know, we've been using canvas cutter since day one Pretty and much. it's a it's a bedroll i mean we just did this hunt in arizona and ryan's driving around inside his old clunker dodge cummins pickup that he thinks is the best vehicle on earth and it's not and he drives that thing around with that grandpa canopy so it's got the canopy but it's extra tall so you know it looks real real cheesy and then but it's pretty nice inside he's got his canvas cutter bed roll back there you roll that sucker out super nice foam mattress it's got the little uh poles in there that pop up so it's kind of like a bivy sack it's waterproof you can throw that thing down anywhere so it really doesn't we don't really travel without them they're that good of a piece of of gear to just have in the back of your truck in your trailer just stuffed in there Usually when we backpack in, we know that when we get back to our truck at the trailhead, sometimes we have to make multiple trips. Often we do. So we leave our gear and our tent up there. And when we get back to the truck, we know we got our bed rolls there. We can just throw them out. If we're, if we're truck hunting, we just throw the bed rolls out, climb in. We don't have to set up tents. We don't have to deal with any of that. It's just you climb in, go to bed, climb, climb out in the morning, get back to, to hunting. And uh, I throw them on top of my cots inside my cargo trailer that I use as a camper. And, um, I love them. So I think it's memory foam in there and then it's got the, the little poles. So you get a discount if you use the code gritty with canvas cutter. And like I said, it's an awesome piece of gear. And then they just came out with some, a duffel. Yep. The burrow, the burrow. And that burrow. looks pretty sick. It's made of the same material, but it's four times as water resistant as the already incredibly water resistant bedrolls. <laughs> Well, I haven't looked, I haven't got my hands on one yet, but it does look pretty sick. It looks pretty legit. It's, mm -hmm. it's a standard size duffel. You can take on a plane, cut to the right dimensions, but it's also got straps that pop in and out of it. So yeah. you can wear it like a backpack if you need to for a bit. When I first saw the canvas cutter, I was like, who's going to use that? I could just mm -hmm. get a bivy sack, yeah. but it's, it's way more comfortable than that. Mm -hmm. There's something about canvas. It zips your, my sleeping bag is already inside. So is my pillow. Rolls up mm -hmm. into a roll, stuff's in the back. They have some new ones that are more compact, Seth was telling me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I want to get my hands on that and check it out. But just go to Canvas Cutter and check it out. It helps us out too. Yep. Helps us uh, keep the show running. And then um, Backcountry Fuel Box. 
with uh, our buddy Cody Rich. It, it gives you things like the shot blocks. If you're a backpacker, black, backcountry fuel box is pretty legit. We had some snafus with the code gritty. Did we have snafus. Co- Cody had some snafus there with the go. code gritty. I, I have enough snafus on my plate. <laughs> I don't need any more added. So it took a while to get our code actually up and running. Mm-hmm. And we've been telling you, use the code, use the code. And then getting lots of emails saying the code isn't working. For those that don't know, the Backcountry Fuel Box is an assortment of awesome foods that come in like a shoe box, mm-hmm. size box. And in there is breakfast, dinners, backcountry snacks and bars, just like these salted watermelon, two times the sodium shop blocks from Cliff. This is the sort of thing that's in there. Mm-hmm. Trail mix, there's cookies, there's And bars. I've never actually had this flavor, you know, and so. What flavor is it? Um, I just told you salted watermelon, salted water. I thought it was margarita this whole time. And what's cool about it is there's tons of stuff that shows up in there. I've never tried before Mm -hmm. or even heard of didn't know existed. And if you're a backpacker hiker at all, or you just like to snack on healthy things throughout the week, this box is legit. You sign up, you get like one a month. It gives you all sorts of stuff. By the time hunting season rolls, rolls around, if you do this for a few months, you're kind of set with a wide array of really good, healthy backcountry fuel options. Um, I was really skeptical at first. I really like it. And then on it, there's a list of foods. Um, discount codes. Discount codes. Of all the foods. Of all the foods in the box. So it's you can, awesome. If you're part of that membership, basically you get, in addition to that, you get codes and discounts that you can then use to purchase the things you like that are in the box. Um, I would say... Nine out of 10 things I like in the box. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes there's something in there. I'm like, not for me, but mm-hmm. I have three kids and a wife that have a different taste than I do. And by the time all said and done, we all like, mm-hmm. it gets consumed and, uh, it's been a really cool resource. I think it's, it's an excellent idea. So use the code gritty over there at backcountry field box. And then, um, e-scouting courses with Mark Livesey at the tree line Academy. If you haven't signed up for that, that's a must. Always use the code GRITTY at PEAKS. Get yourself some trekking poles, the new gaiters, and um, boot dryers. There's been a few of you that have asked us about the boot dryers. From our last gear dump that we Yeah, did. we did a gear dump. I talked about my gear dry, my boot dryer system. You, know, you get sweaty, sweaty feet. You're wearing these all grain, all leather, uh, full, full grain leather boots and um, insulated because it's late season. And, and they just get sweaty. Mm-hmm. And then you're backpacked in, and you just can't dry them. And so, even though I have a, pe- uh, a, a even though I have a stove in the tent, that stove uh, doesn't get the heat inside the boot to dry it out. Heat rises, and heat rises. So, I I go through it in detail on the gear thing. Mm-hmm. I pop my tripod up, get my boots up in the peak of the mm-hmm. of the uh, shelter. We got the stove going, and then I put my little boot dryer fans on there, plug them into my USB, like this dark energy right here mm-hmm. or whatever I'm using. They take one quarter of the amount that it takes to charge your phone and electricity to mm-hmm. run. So it's like for how long? Thing. Like all night? Like all I know is it didn't seem to take a dent out of any of my battery mm-hmm. devices, my chargers. Just didn't do anything to them. So, so I usually run it at night when we get in mm-hmm. because the stove is going in the evening. It's hot. And it warms up the boots, and then I go to bed, and when I wake up in the morning, and we stoke the stove up in the morning again, I get the boot dryer going again for 20 or 30 minutes. By the time I put my boots on to leave the teepee in the morning on a on late season hunt, my boots are fully warm and supple and, and nice. That's powerful. I don't have to like, because in the past, I remember having to put on like ice blocks. And instantly your feet are cold the moment you put them in because you're putting them into an icy cold boot. And and then you go outside and instantly, it doesn't matter if they're insulated, if they're cold, you know, you got to try to gain your heat back into that boot and uh, it's tough. And so anyway, those are at Graxaw. If you want to get those, they're at Graxaw. Use the code gritty there. And Graxaw also sells the awesome game bags that we use that are only six ounces, the orange ones that, that we've been using for a couple of years. And, uh, they're awesome. So check all that out. Use the code gritty at all those. And some of you asked about alpaca rafts, our code expired. It's back in play. If you're looking for a raft, use the code gritty there and get yourself a killer backpacking raft for this coming season. Get it now because it takes a while to order one and get it, get it built. And they're not like cranking them out overnight sitting on the shelf. You call them to get made. Yeah. So 
All right, let's get into the podcast. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast, folks. It's been a spell since I've been in studio. Only like a month. Uh, a week, I guess. I interviewed, uh, we had Jack Carr down, and uh, we were talking uh, film permits. Did some stuff with Tony Bynum, talking about film permits on commercial land, but haven't really sat down in the studio and just uh, shot the breeze and updated people with what's going on. We got a lot of stuff in the pipeline. Brent and I have been uh, working our butts off. Feverishly editing. Yeah. Feverishly editing, creating, um, I think we have seven or eight weeks worth of film content to drop every Sunday. Mm-hmm. We're working on one of them is this Arizona hunt. Here's my buck right here for those that are watching. This is my uh 2021 Arizona archery mule deer buck, and uh, pretty stoked, pretty stoked on this buck. Uh, I bleached that skull, did it um this last week or so. I basically, I've a lot of people have asked me about this the bleaching or how you do this because mm-hmm. it's expensive to have a someone do it for you, mm-hmm. and it's not that hard. Um, takes a little bit of time. I'm not that particular by the way, Mm -hmm. in terms of it being perfect. So those that are watching, um, you know, you get a good look at the skull here. I love this buck. He's got some good mass. We were in Arizona, Ryan and I, a bunch of other friends of ours scattered throughout, you know, I'm following, Mm -hmm. uh, different personalities, Newberg and others that are down there hunting, uh, mule deer. It was hard to come by a big buck. They weren't a mature buck or an old buck. Mm -hmm. There just weren't very many. Uh, This buck is, I'm convinced, um, I got to get Jim Deere, my friend Jim Deere, Arizona uh, deer biologist on the podcast. He's going to come on. We just haven't been able to connect just yet. But there's a, uh, it's crazy. I was was confused. I was like, who's Jim Deere? I thought we were talking about Jim Heffelfinger coming on here. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Jim Heffelfinger. I always call him Jim Deere because that's his Instagram Instagram. handle. Yeah. Jim Heffelfinger. That's correct. And um, we were talking and and, you know, we were in Arizona and there, there really wasn't much moisture this year in Arizona. I mean, it was, it was like a 20 year drought drought of some kind. The monsoon season didn't have a lot of uh, rain in it. Um, some private land hunts and other areas where the deer are uh, maybe have access to some crop or some mm-hmm. additional nutrition. The deer were a little bigger there, but on the public land spaces, especially far away from any kind of private property, you know, they could get moisture. You know, the deer mm-hmm. get water because there's the state is, you know, there's a lot of cattle or, or different um, uh, water guzzlers there to help mm-hmm. them survive. But surviving and thriving are two different, two different things. things. Yeah, if you have to smash your face into a cactus and eat it <laughs> to uh, get by, that's not thriving. Which these deer this year, you know, Ryan and I were talking, and I talked to Jim about. It. I'm going to have him touch on it, but it's it's possible a lot of the du- because we're like, where are all the bucks we saw last year? Mm-hmm. Everything's thirty inches, forty inches smaller than last year. That's a lot. Mm-hmm. I'm like, is that it, it, they could, it couldn't just disappear? It's just that everything was stunted here's the deal he's a badass buck like if you just said i shot this deer yeah and never mentioned anything about a drought that's a sweet deer yeah you love how he curves like a mm-hmm. like a basketball you know yeah. round like and this he's thick sharp bladed heavy mass got some palming it took a while i mean we searched for a while you know ryan shot a gorgeous big coos deer on the last day i shot this buck on the last day i'm so surprised but Ryan uh, had trouble finding, Lampers had trouble finding a buck he wanted to take that was old enough, in, an old enough mule deer that had the, the size he was looking for. And he was willing to put in the hours and the time to find that deer. And he just had a hard time finding one. And the coos deer, the coos deer were doing better. I still think they were stunted as well. But uh, the mule deer especially, it seemed hard to find a big mule deer buck. This is really far south. Now, if you're mid state, uh, or higher up North, seemed like they got some snowpack and they didn't suffer from drought kind of conditions as much as the, the South did. You know, these deer were really concentrated the first, the first couple of weeks, super con- concentrated around water sources. Mm-hmm. They just weren't that far from them. And, um, and then the feed, you can't have luscious, rich, nutritious grasses and such and browse you can't have that in in without rain and so it's like it was just so much dirt and mm-hmm. and nothing else so yeah the deer were able to stay hydrated just drinking water but they didn't have what it took i think to put on 
antler size no calories. and then to maintain um this buck was pretty thick i mean he had some weight on him unlike some of the other bucks i saw mm-hmm. i saw one buck that would give him a run for his money probably bigger than him i saw him one more one day and that was it uh in this one area and he was skinny though his body was pretty lean uh, bony saw a lot of that a lot of hides that weren't looking too sharp and you know like i said different different locales were a little different when you have that shortage of a drought like that sh- kind of shortage of feed and and uh good conditions you're going to find pockets where the deer right there seem to get a better little more nutrition than the next guy just cuz of where they they live and there's a there's some sources over there but the deer we 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 went to all our old haunts all our old spots and they were void of life ghost towns it was wild it's a tough season tough year and uh, this is my fourth year being down there um you know the first year i almost got it done it was a short hunt i did it with randy i did get a an archery quadamundi mm-hmm. which is still like a really proud moment has anyone uh, else shot any no no not that i know of and not with a bow either um and then uh the next two years i was able to get a coos deer each of those years and you saw quadamundi those years not last year, but the not year before. Year. I didn't see a single one last last year at all or in all the year. days. Or this year. But but the first two years I was there, I did. Got one the first year, didn't get one after that. But yeah, the the hunt itself was really different this year compared to the previous three years. Again, I think the deer were in cold, totally different areas or they weren't moving. The rut was dead. They just didn't rut. I mean, it's dead. So I'm putting together a film of the hunt and I think people are going to, you know, it's, I, I kind of self filmed it, right. I'm my own cameraman and now and then I'll get somebody to run a camera next to me. That's pretty, you know, that doesn't really know what they're doing or, or just is kind of holding the camera for me. I set the settings and hand it off, but on an archery hunt, you know, it's really tough. You kind of need a dedicated cameraman because unlike a rifle hunt where I can set up the camera and then shoot, you know, uh, depending on the conditions. With a bow hunt, you know, you're focused on just making the kill. It, you, it It's so hard to self-film. And you could mount a GoPro or something to your head or your body or something and try to auto-film. And But I'm I'm really not a fan of cons- watching that kind of content much. It's, it's tough mm-hmm. to do. And so this hunt is, you, you're going to see a lot of, a lot of deer. Uh, and you're going to, you're going to know how the hunt went down mm-hmm. from start to finish. You're going to have a good view of it's going to, it's going to be, you're going to understand what the conditions are like, what the deer are feeding on the whole time, uh, which is mostly just cactus, mm-hmm. like jumping cactus. It's unreal. They're just chomping spiky giant cactus. I don't know how they do it. They've got to like approach it with a lot of anger. That's how <laughs> I imagine. That yeah. doe that's a, that you got recorded, she's eating that thing like she's mad at it. You yeah, you're around. trying to figure out where they're, you, you're trying to figure out where they're how they're eating it with the spikes, not like just wounding them beyond Mm -hmm. reason because you walk by them and you just pick one up barely and it Mm -hmm. goes through your shoe and you're like, "Uh -uh!" you know, you're dying yet. They got them hanging off their face and their lips. Like it's no big deal. And, and I, well, that's something when you ask Jim, do they just evolve to not have feeling in their face? I don't know because I mean, they're outside. It's cold. Sometimes (laughs) it's not beneficial to feel that. Or getting stabbed in the face with a horn. Well, I think you need to have feel a certain amount so you don't get hurt. That's what pain kind of helps you do. Like if your hand's burning on a stove, from what it I helps tell, to know it's burning. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> but from the way that doe was eating that cactus, she wasn't feeling no pain. Yeah, I don't know. Like she but, seemed unfazed. Yeah, Brent got to has been reviewing the footage as I've been editing it afterward, and you're getting a view for it. But yeah, it was a crazy hunt. Uh, so I want to get into talk about bleach in the school. People are asking about this all the time. Um, I just don't think it's that big a deal. Uh, Ryan uses that Bridger boil, mm-hmm. which I needed to get one, but I'm cheap, but it, it's got a little, it's like a stainless steel box for elk or deer. Mm-hmm. And you just plop it in there and it kind of goes around the horns. It looks like, hmm. so the horns are completely out of the, the container. Oh, okay, okay. And then you just have enough water around the actual skull to then cook it or boil it. And so then it just, you just simmer it. You don't want to boil 
the skull mm-hmm. because boiling causes the bones to fall you want apart like and an occasional bubble. Yeah, it's really just simmer. You know, let it get like if there's a couple of bubbles that come up every now and then, it's probably about right. You're kind of steaming it almost. Mm-hmm. After like six, eight hours, I don't know. I pull it out and then I have a pressure washer and I have a pretty stout pressure washer. And cause I don't really care about this delicate nose crap in there or whatever. I'm mm-hmm. like, when you find a skull out in the countryside, show what you're talking about with that one. Yeah. This is a, this is my, my uh, warrior bear that I shot. Check that out. Uh, gnarly. for those that are watching, this is the bear skull. I did this one at the same time as the deer. And you can see, uh, if you're watching the video, um, this bear is old, 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 probably the oldest bear maybe I've ever taken. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, I shot a couple 21 inch skull bears in Prince of Wales Island, but mm-hmm. this was, this was here in, uh, the States and one of those mountain hunts that Ryan and I were on. I have the picture of this bear's mouth wide open and you can see this whole canine's busted off and you can see the root up in there and you can see these teeth missing in the front. And they're missing in the photo as well. Like yeah. he's missing a lot of his teeth up here. He's missing some teeth. Uh, they're pretty worn out. He's missing a bunch. They're down to the gum line, which is funny. Now you can see the teeth, but mm-hmm. but uh, in the photo you can tell. He looked. I didn't know he had hardly any. Their teeth, teeth are because you can see the roots in the teeth where mm-hmm. they don't. They're supposed to be up here filling his, you know, the gap mm-hmm. there, but. The gum line just, they were just smooth against the the gum line. Same way. You can also see there. the root in that big tooth up top. Yeah, that big one with the canine, you can just see the root going in. Is a dead mm-hmm. tooth? It's all broken off. Yeah. But you can, it's pretty cool. Um, bear skulls when are you, a little uh, easier. Put you know, that, like, no, I'm saying, like, when you have it sideways, yeah. If you turn it, if you put it just like you're talking through its mouth. Yeah. It's a cool angle. Like, like that. Yeah. I mean, look at the side. I mean, look at that thing. I mean, you definitely don't want to get bit by, uh, I mean, look how big their mouths will open Yeah, and those canines just mm-hmm. coming down. I mean, and bears could it are, technically open more than that? Uh, or looks that- like, it looks like that's the maximum it can open right there, mm-hmm. which is plenty. Mm-hmm. It's like a friggin' <laughs> like, it looks like a, 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 some kind of tractor, uh, uh hydraulic. Yeah, like, no, it looks <laughs> terrifying. Yeah. Like you tell people that's just like a black bear skull. Yeah. Like well, and right here you have the nose that I was telling you the delicate nose stuff. Right. Um, Shove that towards the camera as close. As you when can. it gets, when it gets, you know, when that nose, if you use beetles or something, I don't like, I don't like looking at it. It's creepy. When you use me. beetles, it kind of gets in there and cleans it all out. If mm-hmm. you use a pressure washer, like I do, you can break some of that. I really don't care. No one's ever really mentioned any of my schools and they're missing all that stuff most of the time. Cause I, I don't know. I like the rustic kind of look anyway. Mm-hmm. So anyway, uh, our friends did this Lacey and her, and her husband, they had some beetles and they, they did the beetle thing with this. And then I just, I just pressure washed it afterward and then bleached it. And they still uh, a couple more coats of bleach, right? Yeah, they, you know, you see how white this one is versus that one. Um, the beetle it's thing. It's got a little yellow tinge to it. Yeah, the beetle thing left it pretty yellow, where um, when I pressure wash it, it's bright white and then it bleaches pretty quick. Its teeth are also naturally yellow, so you're not bleaching the teeth at all, right? No. Nope. Nope. The teeth are yellow. That's just how they are. They're kind of ivory, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, I will, I will um, glue this with epoxy probably. At some point. So it's like this open and then uh i have a stand that i'm gonna have that'll hold it just like this on the stand that's terrifying and it'll just kind of sit there i think it's cooler open yeah epoxied and kind of glued it like gives you the appreciation for what a black bear when it's closed like when it's down like this or this you're really missing out on Mm -hmm. it's hidden i have a stack of these you know uh, but some of these special ones those three the other two giants i have from pow um I'm just going to, I'm going to epoxy them open like this and then just kind of, um, let them sit on some stands and let, let you really appreciate the, uh, ferocity of these critters and what you're dealing with. But, um, back to the boiling, I just boil it, pull it out. And then I take my pressure washer and pressure wash it. And, uh, in, on the, on the deer, especially, and the elk, there's these ear holes right here. Mm-hmm. And if you take like a screwdriver or something, you can pop those bones out. They're just like a little ear hole bone mm-hmm. in the back, I guess. 
pop those out. And then when you pressure wash it through all these angles, just, it, it cleans real easy. If you don't pop those out and then you're pressure washing here, mm-hmm. the, the brain matter and all the junk really doesn't come out as easily. It doesn't go through the sinuses. It doesn't come out those holes. You can't get at it as easily. So what happens if you leave some bits in there? Is that a big deal? Uh, yeah. I mean, it can stink and be gross. I mean, it is, it's cooked meat, you know? So I don't, it's not hard to get it. It gets out, Mm -hmm. you know, if it's sticky and it doesn't, the meat or the skin or the hair or whatever, whatever's not coming off the skull, then you probably need to, you probably need to cook it longer, you know, simmer it longer. So it's softer, but bear is easy. You can drop that in a crock pot or something and simmer Mm -hmm. that. Uh, there's no horns to worry about. So these, I do these in a turkey fryer. Yep. That you pot that you just get from like Cabela's. You, so and you wrap in or- that one up with tin foil around the horns. Yeah, because I don't have a fancy Bridger boil like Lampers. So I wrap it up in tin foil, and then I just drop it in the giant pot. And it's a it's more than it's huge. I use that for elk, mm-hmm. but Bridger boil makes and elk those boil. those elk boilers. And if you travel across state lines and you're bringing a head back. A lot of times they, the, the, the law for some States, you need to be boiling that. So you don't transfer CWD. So you need to be boiling it and killing everything in the, in the brain cavity before you bring it across state lines. If you're taking something from Canada or even from New Zealand or internationally, same kind of thing. Like you want to cook gotta be clean. some of that spinal fluid kind yeah. of brain matter so that you don't transmit any diseases. Um, that's where that little bridger boil is nice. It's tiny. It has a little propane burner kind of thing that you hook up to it. And when we're out hunting, Lampers can throw his skull on there, add some water, and it's right in the back of his truck. And he can he can boil it then. He can pressure wash it later when you get home. Um, but it's really easy to do. It's not hard. I pressure wash it. And then once it's pressure washed, I use this right here. And uh, this is Clairol Professional pure white cream developer, um, 40 vol, whatever, like this is hair bleach Mm -hmm. and it's kind of like a, a cream or a paste. Where do you buy that? I just, I don't know. I think Suzanne bought it. (laughs) I'm sure you can get it wherever. Google it. Yeah. And, uh, basically I just use this little brush. I think you get these brushes with it. Mm -hmm. Girls know all this. You ask your wives if you're a guy. You know, but you just like take it and you just brush it on there. Try not to get it on anything you don't want to turn white because it'll turn white. And uh, it usually takes a few days and and a few extra coats just to keep putting it on there until mm-hmm. it finally changes color. And the bear was the same thing. Now the bear was like out there for months and it it was outside. The beetles cleaned it, but then it kind of they didn't clean it quickly. The beetles had trouble surviving in uh, the winter time and stuff and keep staying alive. So they did a great job, but there was still like, still, you know, bits of matter, skin and things that kind of stuck on there. And it has an odor to it. That's hard to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And I've bleached it and done a bunch of stuff to try to clean it or get the odor off of it. I don't get that when I, boil it and spray it and bleach it. You know, it's, it's the, the beetles. My first time using the beetles. I've heard some people say the beetles can make it stink. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I'm no taxidermist. I'm a DIY, uh, DIY slacker. Yeah. (laughs) So, um, I'm not the guy to ask about that, but I think it's pretty easy to do though. And you ought to just, if, if you're on a budget, doesn't, I swear I have a process now. I just drop it in the pot after I've caped it, boil it for, or or simmer it lightly Mm -hmm. for a while, pull it out after it's been in there a day, pressure wash it with my pressure washer. Ryan will take, you know, he'll use a more delicate pressure washer and then he'll take, you know, cause he doesn't want to wreck it or whatever. And he might take a little scraper and scrape it. You know, I don't do that stuff. It's too much work. I just, full on <laughs> heavy duty pressure washer it. and just slam what lives it. lives. Yeah. And I, I, I smash it hard and you can look at it. I mean, um, it looks nice. It's a skull. It looks nice. So the, I don't, I don't know that it's necessary 
to put more work into it than that. So, some of the websites and stuff when I was looking into it and YouTube channels were like, don't don't pressure wash it hard. Just just do it lightly, you know, with like, don't get it one over like whatever PSI, I don't know. And uh, I tried that and I'm like, what's the point? It's like running a hose on it. Like you, I actually have to get down and scrape mm-hmm. this stuff off. That's n- no, I want a sandblaster. Uh-huh. So then I, I use the pressure washer and I make it quick and easy. All my elk, elk are much heavier duty, mm-hmm. you know, less delicate. You can hammer that, you know, with a bear, you might lose teeth if you're not careful. A deer, if you cook it too long, you definitely will. You know, you don't. I've had bears be in a pot too long. Bear schools especially, they'll split. The bottom jaw will split in half. Ooh, that's no bueno. Um, you and I, when we were in um, Prince, when of I, Wales? Prince of Wales and we boiled that school, we boiled it hot mm-hmm. for hours. And then... Yeah, because we read, boil it. Yeah. Okay. And then all the seams in the school, uh, the growth plates, all just came apart. And I had mm-hmm. this school in pieces. And you had to try to glue it back together to salvage mm-hmm. what what remained. So... Definitely, you want it to be strong. That's why a, a light simmer is great. And then the teeth are still intact. The bone isn't softened and it mm-hmm. works great. So anyway, that's it for today's show. I uh, hope you liked it. Leave us a comment if you liked it. We always appreciate that. Go to the YouTube channel, subscribe, follow along there. Look for our next upcoming videos. And as always, stay gritty. <laughs>